I'm in the Ashdown Forest, in East Sussex, former home of the high brown fritillary butterfly, a rather enigmatic species that has shown significant declines in its abundance since the 1950s and is now a real conservation priority. However, this year I travelled to Dartmoor and Exmoor and was lucky enough to see the butterfly in some of those locations where it still occurs. <music> Really good to see you, Nick. I do, I do. Do you know, I, I absolutely can't believe that last time we met, we talked about the high brown, and then by serendipity, you told me about your whole involvement with uh, the early research. Uh, and so you brought me here. Where is this? Well, we're on the Dart Valley, which is a valley uh, that has its name given to it by the river, the River Dart, which also then gives its name to Dartmoor, where we are. So um, this is my favourite little patch in the world. But yeah, I got to know this place from dawn to dusk, um, pretty much through three or four butterfly seasons. Um, and yeah, and I don't get a chance to come here that often nowadays, but of course I've got family and stuff. So yeah, it's really special to be here today. I'm really and, uh, pleased that we're giving you an excuse to get out. Definitely. Um, so why don't we go and have a look and then you can maybe tell me about all of the details of your history with this insect. Yeah, that'd be great. And hopefully we're, we've got this right and we'll at least see a couple of reasonably uh, good individuals because we're, we're about midway through the season, I think. Oh, well, we can live in hope. Yeah. So, you were at university? Yeah, I, I was at university. I chose Exeter University, which is um, you know, not, not far from here, I guess. Um, not really for the course, um, and it's okay, I have told them about that. <laughs> but because it was next to two national parks, and my interest in those national parks was that they're the best place for wildlife. And of course, as a child, butterflies are a massive part of my life. I reared so many. British species, just so I could understand oh, them. And I remember you telling me about the high brown fertility in the Ashdown Forest. Well, that's right. So I was, you know, I was based in East Sussex in the Ashdown Forest, and butterflies were everything. So summer holidays were about butterflies. So I'd go out, and of course the high brown flew bang in the middle of the summer holiday. So it was yeah. perfect for me. And it was a butterfly that I slowly watched vanish. There was a site not far away where it was found, and I remember finding it and thinking, "Oh, this is, you know, it's a beautiful butterfly." It was up there with the dark green. I was amazed to find these two butterflies and be able to tell them apart, of course, because all the field guides told me how difficult that was. And yeah. of course, if I could tell them apart, I was also a much better entomologist than I thought. So that's how it started. And then I, every year I'd try and find them both. And then I just sort of noticed them petering out. And it was only um, many years later when I was involved with butterfly conservation uh, um, uh, and Martin Warren in particular um, was my boss. And I was involved with putting together something called the High Brown Fertility Site Dossier, right. which was a, uh, a document which um, basically collated all the high brown records um, because we were beginning to get very worried about this massive decline in this butterfly in the, uh, since the 1950s. So, um, so which, yeah, was, that, which was going on for a lot of butterflies at that time. It was, wasn't it? yeah. And the, but the high brown was really, it was plummeting really seriously, really fast, very suddenly. And from a butterfly that used to be very common in in woodlands throughout the south of the UK um, um, and in Wales and everything. It was, it was a butterfly, it was, used to be a very common wooden butterfly, so suddenly yeah. it was vanish. It was telling us something was changing. Um, yeah. So anyway, so yeah, I put the high brown fertility dossier together and I remember looking at it and looking at, I, I saw the word, you know, Ashdown Forest, I thought, hang on, that's, that's where I grew up. And I'm looking at it and I can see the records just going down and then suddenly it's a line of zeros. And that, that coincided so with exactly the season when I was actually a kid growing up in, in the Ashdown Forest. So you, you, you basically observed a local extinction? I did. I observed a local extinction and that changed my whole view of the natural world and our role within it. Because up to that point, extinct for me, when I was a child, yeah. was dodos and things like that. Yeah. It was a historic thing. The extinction happened in the past. It didn't happen now. But that was the first thing I suddenly realised that, yeah, no, it is happening now. And since I've been living here on Dartmoor... Um, even sites that I knew back in the 90s have gone. So the valley I live in used to have high brown fertility in it. They've vanished in the, in the last few years. Um, so 
it really does galvanize you and give you a, a focus because you know we have to understand this we have to understand why we're losing these species and if you're losing butterflies you can bet you're going to be losing a whole suite of other less extroverts less obvious invertebrates so so butterflies are, are basically high they're, they're they're, they're, they're little bits of flying environmental litmus paper. And as we say, this is a fritillary just coming down oh, yeah, the path. Yeah. Yep, so that's, uh, that's definitely a high brown, although <laughs> it's, very, it's so worn and beaten down that you're not really seeing the, uh, the, 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 the vibrant joy this butterfly can, can provide. Yeah, and in but, this yeah. case, I don't think I've ever seen a butterfly fly with just three wings. But that's what they're like. They just keep going until they crash. You know, I mean, they, they will be, they're on the go. The males in particular, this is a male, um, just by the size of its abdomen and the yeah. fact it is looking so battered. Um, this would have braved, you know, it's been raining up here, we've had a lot of strong winds, they'll be bashing around uh, in the bracken themselves and that yeah. takes its toll and this animal, you know, hopefully, although it's still on the wing, it's whether or not it's found it's, it's mated with a female. Um, but the males come out first, so this is, I'm not saying it's disappointing because the point is the butterflies here and that's yeah. better than a lot of people have seen. Yeah. However, what we really want now is a nice, big, gloriously vibrant and uh, productive looking female and yeah. um I, I i think we're our chances are pretty good no oh, it's a big ask though isn't it you're setting us up a big task yeah but seeing a high brown fertility is a big task and we've just achieved that one yeah. yeah so that's patrolling like a, that was a male fun fact that i'd say was a high brown right in front of your camera dark green it's much faded much paler around the edges just went up around that gorse bush on this side it's brilliant for both of them it's easy to sort of start thinking about the dark green as not being as important as high brown of course you know you miss them when they're gone as well but they're, they're slightly more versatile ecologically so oh takes me back <laughs> So, so what's, what was the survey work like, actually, you know, day to day? Oh, I, I mean, there's the butterfly side of it, which is great. So obviously that was the big drive. But I sort of found myself staying. We, we rented a little cottage just over the hill over there, actually, just over yeah. in Hull. And the team of people worked. So we, we, held, we, we sort of shacked up with the team working on the large blue. So the legendary site X. And I met, to me, he's a legend. I have told him this. It's a bit embarrassing, but I'm a bit <laughs> gushing about this. But... You know, I was sharing a house with Jeremy Thomas, which, unless you're really into butterflies, doesn't necessarily mean anything. But Jeremy Thomas was the man who, who was involved with reintroducing the large blue. He sort of effectively watched it go extinct and was yeah. doing everything again. So, to, so to meet him and Dave Simcox and uh, and then I was staying. It with, was a dream, wasn't it? It was a dream, and I was we, I was staying, you know, with Martin Warren and Matthew Oates and and a whole bunch of other people, all staying in this one cottage. So suddenly I'm surrounded by people that I would call real heroes. They're not. They're not media heroes. They're not people. Sort of naturalist celebrities, really. Yeah, I think so. And in some ways, they've probably got, they've got a better claim to the word celebrity because they've done something, yeah. something significant in their lives, um, to make the world a better place. There's Ooh. a high brown. That's a female. Fantastic. Oh, we're, we're, they're going very fast at the moment. When it cools down a little bit later, hopefully we'll get them on on uh, brambles or even egg laying, which would be perfect. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's how the whole thing started. And then I was volunteering, and then eventually managed to, they found some money for me as well, so I did get paid in the end. But I was basically being, this was the mad thing, by the end of it, I was getting paid to run around on these slopes, catching one of the most enigmatic butterfly species, and painting little tiny dots on their wings so we could recognize them as individuals. Didn't yeah. harm the butterfly, yeah, but it yeah, meant yeah. that if I caught that butterfly somewhere else, and you made a note of it, you could then plot where these butterflies were found uh, and where they were going yeah. and, and at what sort of range they had. So and range was one thing, did yeah, you do anything else? No, that was, well, it was range, uh, obviously by if, you're, if you're surveying like that you're getting population data. So did you, you do a regular transect? Yeah, well, uh, we weren't doing transects as much, okay. we did do transects for other projects for right. just general um, species ID, we did a few of them but they were sort of thrown in later when they said well while you're there could you just do a few transects but yeah. the main the main um crux of the uh, uh, of what we're doing was trying to work out how many butterflies were here how they were interacting anything we could find out about their autocology because up until that point only a handful of eggs um had been seen to be laid 
um, in the wild by by contemporary scientists. I mean, there, there, there's lots of butterfly greats that have witnessed this, of course, but but by people who are able to measure the the, the micro um, climate, uh, climate of of the each egg laying site and where we found the caterpillars and things like that. So it really requires someone who tuned in completely. So I really was I was trying to be a high bound fertility for all these summers, and, uh -huh. and it started early on in the season. So I spent when the bracken was down in, in the spring, which is just a brown slope of bracken litter with violets popping up through it. I would be walking backwards and forwards, and a good day I might have found one, maybe two caterpillars. So a whole working day to find one caterpillar, and that's pretty intense because they are random. Well, they're not randomly spread over, but we're trying to get into the minds of the butterflies. Why were they selecting particular areas? Why was this a hot spot? And why were we losing them elsewhere? And also, how come we had populations that were seen to be very, very strong, and then we'd have these populations that popped up? They're like a pop-up population, and they do really well, and then they just vanish. And it turns out that these probably work in what you call a meta population. So you have a, a stronghold, and in a really good year, when the weather hits and everything everything works in their favour, they spill out, they bubble out into surrounding pockets of sub-marginal habitat. And they do okay there for a few years, and then if, if the conditions get a bit rubbish, so you get a really wet summer or wet spring, cold spring or something, then they basically they, they, they vanish, and then you get go back to the stronghold. And that seems to be the way this butterfly species works. Uh, Nick, what is it that the female's looking for when she's laying her eggs? Well, she's looking to lay eggs right now. So we keep seeing these females dropping down. They're moving very fast around this slope and they keep dropping down between the bracken fronds. And when you actually enter the bracken jungle, because on the face of it, it looks like it's good for nothing. It's like a dense canopy of bracken and nothing else. But if you get in here and part the fronds and look at the ground, you'll see exactly what it is she's looking for. Um, now. It's all about temperature in the spring. So even though these slopes look like these fairly lush, green um, monocultures, I guess, of bracken, you've kind of got to think of this as a woodland canopy. So at the moment, it's very shady and dense. But if you get in and part the fronds, you'll see the essence of what the females are selecting for. You see, this is perfect. You've got this litter of bracken, lots of old dead bracken litter. This is quite crispy. Um, and then you've got these beautiful, lush, heart-shaped violets. That's the caterpillar's food plant. So what she's doing now is looking for somewhere like this where there's the smell of violets in the air, but equally she can lay her eggs, not on the violets, but actually on bits of frond and bits of dead vegetation. Sometimes they use gorse and dead grass and sometimes even stones, but here on Dartmoor they prefer the dead bracken litter. And now what this does, it sets up her babies, her caterpillars for next spring, because in the spring all this stuff will be gone, all the bracken will be dead and folded down. It'd be like a mulch covering this entire slope. And not so thick that the violets can't push up between it. So what you've got is this lovely, crispy, warm environment. And the caterpillar loves that. It can sunbathe on the bracken where the temperature gets really warm. In fact, the difference between um, this sort of habitat and the equivalent uh, uh, grass habitat is something like 10 to 15 degrees. So the caterpillar can really soak up the rays. It charges itself with the sun, sun's energy, just like the adult butterfly and then will crawl on, eat as much leaf as it can, and then it can digest when its body's up to temperature. And it carries on repeating this thing all the way through the spring um, until it's ready to form a chrysalis. So this is pretty much, it's kind of like forward think um, in your mind to what the environment would be like in the spring, and that is what the female butterfly is selecting for right now. Um, the other habitat that they're, they're doing really well on is the limestone pavements um, yes. uh, up in uh, Lancashire and, and, and places like that where you've got this limestone which again heats up in the sun yeah. and you've got these little cracks and crevices that support the violet so it's perfect for the butterfly so it does really well there but it's a completely different habitat to this and probably a little bit easier to ma I mean I don't know I have no experience but it's possibly a little bit man easier to manage in the sense of here it's all about the balance between the, the right kind of grazing at the right time of the year, the dying practices of the commoner um, uh, and climate change and all sorts of other things that we, we haven't necessarily been able to measure yet, all come as a real weird balance. And some years it all lines up and you get a really good year, yeah. a bumpy year, like last year with the butterfly counts here were pretty good. Um, and then, I mean, I know a few years ago, um, the butterfly uh, um, people were doing the transects here um, we're saying, you know, it's nearly gone from here. And if it goes from here, we've pretty much lost it from its one of its last strongholds in the UK. Do you know, funny thing, Nick, is that the, the story that you're telling me is what so many people tell me about various butterflies. And, and, and in part, I think that what we're talking about is 
are species on the northern edge of their European ranges. So, so temperature is absolutely crucial, isn't it? It's the thing that really drives them in terms of their niche specialisation. I think so, and the way we use the landscape has changed massively, and, and our connection with that landscape and our, our dependence on that landscape is very different. So as a consequence, the butterfly's been hit massively. So, you know, the reports or the, or, or the um, you know, historic reports pretty much say this is a woodland butterfly. Um, and it's never really, in my lifetime, it's never been a woodland butterfly. It's always been a, a butterfly of these weird edges, these fringes, um, these grassland, sort of rough grassland areas. Um, but, in, but, in, but you're talking about a human's lifespan, so that seems like a very long time, but in sort of ecological terms, it's nothing, it's isn't nothing, it? It's nothing, nothing at all, yeah. I mean, it's changed mass, and just in the last 20 years, we've lost it from um, the, the, the Teen Valley, for example, which is you know, where I live. You know, part of the reason I live there is because it's where the high ground fertility was. Mm. Oh, that is absolutely incredible. <sighs> that is just what we wanted. Yeah, so, a nice female catching the, the evening light just perfectly. So we've seen these insects batting about on the slopes all afternoon. And uh, it's a bit frustrating because it's a really hot day. And of course, yeah. when they're hot, they're moving. So uh, this is, we've given it, this patience paid off. It's, it's just that last catch the last rays of the sun. I can't believe it's still staying in one place. No, the, well, this is it. Occasionally, this is the joy of this. I mean, they're frustrating, but for every moment that you've missed getting close to them, um, they'll give you one every now and then like this, and then it makes that all the other sweeter. But uh, yeah, that's, she's not perfect, but she is a reasonable, you know, she's bright. She's, she's probably mated. She's probably like, you know, just looking for places and laying eggs now. That's yeah, and, job, and just obviously resting for the evening. Yeah, that's great. And she'll be off up into the trees in a minute to roost. So day two, Nick. Thanks for coming all the way to Exmoor. Brilliant. Oh, it's good to be here. It's the first time I've been to an Exmoor high brown site, so hoping to learn a lot today. And I think you know Dave. Dave, how would you describe yourself? Oh, well, I'm an ecologist and uh, I've done a lot of work on, on Exmoor over the years. I'm, I live in Dalverton just down the road. So and where have you my... guys met before? Yeah, we met at a, a, a fritillary meetings that went on back in the I think early 90s. It would have been, it? yeah, yeah. I was still a student then. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now what pleases me about this is that, that when you finished your work, Dave then was commissioned to do surveys for both Dartmoor and Exmoor, isn't that right? That's right, yeah. yeah. Right. So let's see what we can find here today. Great. Rip. So Dave, the distribution of this species has clearly declined. I mean, that's what the national stats say. What have you seen locally? Yeah, I mean, I've been coming out on these Exmoor sites for 20 odd years now, and uh, Hedden Valley, where we are today, is, is still a very strong population. But the other Exmoor sites have all disappeared in the last uh, 10, 15 years or so. Nick, what about uh, in Dartmoor? That mirrors the same for us, really. You know, not, not and, and, and the, the crazy thing is we can't really, none of us can put our finger on exactly what it is. We understand the big decline, the big national decline, um, which was once common throughout the south. Yeah. Um, and we can, we're pretty confident, I believe, in saying that was connected to the cessation of, um, of coppice practice. We don't, we don't coppice anymore. It just simply is not an economical thing that yeah. people do. And as a consequence, you know, we lost the butterfly. Yeah. However, these sites, I think I'm right in saying, were always marginal sites. These were sites that were always um, on the fringes. You know, you go back and look at what the old entomologists were saying, the old butterfly collectors. They were always referring to these sites as almost in a, a derogatory way. These places were never, they were never as good here, you know. Yeah. Um, and that, unfortunately, that's pretty much what we've got left. If you're talking at a national picture, we've only got these marginal sites left. So, so, so if, these, if these, like, some of the big sites that, that we visited over this weekend, if they're gone, then... What's the prognosis, Dave? What do you reckon? Well, I think it is a little bit of a gloomy picture. You know, on these bracken sites, we still don't really have a handle on how we should be managing them. We know that cutting, grazing are useful tools, but it's very hard to hold the bracken at that stage where, you know, you've got the bracken litter and the abundant violets and just hold it at that point. You know, it's, it's very, very hard. Uh, so... 
I, I, I'm, I am a little bit pessimistic. Well, what would we have to do, Nick? Nick if, you, if you had the magic wand, what would it well, be? Well, I mean, obviously, you can look at... The, the logic is to look at how these sites were historically used. So there was bracken cutting going on for bedding, etc. And we had um, stock levels on. But trying to get an answer for... You know, trying to work out what levels of stock, or how many head of cattle or sheep yeah. or whatever it was that was grazing here, actually makes a difference. It's very difficult because also that what, what falls into that then is is when we graze is you know you can say oh, I had this number of cattle on yeah. here a year but they brought it probably up here all year whereas nowadays it's all very different the way we manage our stock on these sites is different even if the counts of the heads are the same yeah what, what is it like here Dave what is the grazing like any idea I think it's very very you can see it's very light there's very very little stock and that's you know mirrored all over bracken sites all over southwest England and why, why do you think this is any idea well, uh, it's not an attractive habitat to, to farm on. It's not very productive, and you know there's a big problem with with ticks, particularly on bracken sites with mm. high densities that carry diseases that yeah. you know are damaging to to stock. So we both talked to sorry, Nick, but there's a theory there that straight away that you know we talked to people about tick increases. I mean, again, I don't know how much evidence there is for this, or whether it's anecdotal, but. Um, tick increases have been linked to higher humidity, mm. warmer winters, all the rest of it. Yeah. So could there be an invo yeah, could there be a climate change component to this, yeah, this yeah, argument? Yeah, yeah. And then I think on top of that, we've got all sorts of other things that have changed since. So we have, um, um, well, we can't. There's there's atmospheric um, nitrification of, of, of the soil yes. that changes. But some suggest that bracken likes that a lot. So yeah. the bracken has increased, and maybe they're more productive than it was. Therefore, it's more dense, and maybe it swamps out a lot of the breeding habitat. Because as I said, it's a balance between getting the right density of bracken, and then you've got things like. Um, uh, some of the shoot, you know, sh uh, sh pheasant shoots and stuff like that. I know a couple of sites, again, it's anecdotal, but they're right next to what were co core high brown sites. And you mm. can't tell me a pheasant is going to go, I'm not going to eat that caterpillar, I'm going to go to the grain bin later. It's not going to happen. These birds yeah. are there in massive, non, it's a non native species, it's, been, it's in massive, unsustainable numbers anyway. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, that's going to have to have an effect as well. So that and bad timing and uh, dodgy winters and just a bit of bad luck as well. Sure. Um, a little a little fluctuation in, in, in weather trends and you can lose a site. And once you've lost a key site, you've lost all the other metapopulation. Uh, yeah. as, as, as surrounding so it. both of you have been telling me about this being a marginal habitat and that historically we were looking more at woodland. So what's hmm. the opportunities in woodland? Well, I mean, I, you know, I personally think that without a reintroduction of, of coppicing, uh, that you know, we are going to con continue struggling. And I know there's a lot of difficulties in getting coppice woodland management going again. But, you know, for Heath Retillery on Exmoor, there's been a bit of work done and, and it's been very successful. And I'd like to see uh, us at least trying to find some areas where we could we could try and do the same for High Brown. Nick, you were telling me that one of the problems is a lot of the woodlands around here is ancient woodland. Well, yeah, because the thing is, a lot of the, we've got so little of our original woodland cover left that, of course, the bits we've got are important in their own right. So, you know, we've got ancient, big old ancient woodlands. To, mm. to, to introduce coppicing to some of these places would just not be practical. Yeah. Um, well, not practical, it would meet a lot of resistance. Is because there you, be, there'd be other species. So, they're, 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 one of the thoughts is that we've got a lot of these old sites, historic sites, which are now isolated completely from any other location where there's high brown fertilities. Possibly there's a, an argument for reintroduction of a species there. If you've mm. got the habitat working, then maybe there's a chance. But again, so, so East Sussex, so high brown fertility sites on my old stomping ground, I would say was a case in point because it looks pretty similar. It, it just get the stocking right, get, you know, get it, get the balance right. And was, just was that woodland or was that? Well, so there was two. There was wood, woodland and woodland edge, but there were some areas which were, which were, in fact, some of the stronger areas were bracket because I went back and visited them having been to the yeah. Dartmoor sites I went back and looked at them you know I go back to see my dad you know yeah. so I go back to see dad I'll nip up and have a little look at the, the sites and you get that feel for a habitat and you think mm. well yeah this kind of I was a high brown fertility this got everything I need but if you were to manage in the Ashdown forest for high brown and then to reintroduce but I think they already have I think the fact, the fact they've got stock back on the sites which they take right. the stock off because they were concerned so about think... roadkill uh, animals wandering on the road they put fences up to stop the animals wandering onto the road they're now being stocked again. So, I so think you're that's arguing there. there is a case to put the high brown back onto the Ashdown Forest because it would be very obvious, wouldn't it? I you think know? so. I know it's a very, conscientious, uh, a very controversial, um, contentious issue. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's viable in certain circumstances. But it is a way forward. I think so, yeah.
Well, it's, it's been, it's got a bit overcast a bit, so, but we have seen a lot of butterflies, haven't we? So, surprisingly so, actually. There's a lot, lot more seen yesterday than I thought we were going to see, and, and today as well. Has been How many do you think we saw yesterday? Um, I wasn't counting, but probably 30, 40, something like that. I think that's yeah. fair. What 30, do you 40 think? high browns, actually. Yeah, and that, that was on Dartmoor. What, yeah. what, what about on in Exmoor today? I mean, obviously, it's not been ideal conditions. It's I really don't know. Similar? Maybe a little bit more, do you think? Hard to know. Hard to judge. I, I, my gut tells me maybe a little bit less. Oh, is it? Yeah. What okay. do you think? I don't think it's important. The fact they're here. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think that's it. I mean, obviously, for me, is that you know, there's a lot of negativity associated um, with the species. Like, well, the fritillaries in general, let's face it, they're not doing very well as a group anyway. But the fact we've still got them, yeah. and that's really, you know, ha having known sites we've lost them from completely, but the fact these sites still have them gives us some kind of hope. It's when we've lost all of these, then, you know, we've lost everything. But we've still got them, so when we've still got a population, I believe we've still got some kind of hope. I'd agree. Well, guys, thank you so much, both of you. I'm, honestly, okay. it's been Pleasure. great fun, real great fun, and I'm really grateful for the time you both give me. It's been good fun as well. I'm enjoying Enjoyed it. Enjoyed it, yeah. Well, after we shot that footage, Martin Warren and I discussed the idea of a reintroduction of the high brown fertility into the Ashdown Forest here in East Sussex. His view was that if the habitat was right, then there was no good reason why a reintroduction shouldn't be attempted. Not being completely satisfied with leaving the idea there, at the 2016 AGM for Butterfly Conservation Sussex branch, I asked the committee members present what their view was on this concept. After some hesitation, the response was positive. I then asked for a show of hands from the 80 or so members present if they would like to see this insect back in the Sussex landscape. The wall of raised hands was overwhelming. Look what you've started, Nick Baker. Mm -hmm.